so it's an honor to be here. Honor to be here with you guys. Um, I, I was thinking one time about the life of an evolutionist and how, you know, the Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. It's well to remember that. Uh, can y'all hear me in the back? Uh, the way of the transgressor is hard. I believe that's Proverbs 15, 12, or 12, 15, somewhere in there. And uh, I know that I counseled a friend who had gone through a bitter divorce and so forth, and she was done wrong, and, and she had been transgressed against and so on. And it was comforting to her to, 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 to know that he's not getting off scot-free, maybe in the light eyes of the law of the land, but not in the eyes of God. And uh, so I was thinking about that, and I kind of transferred it, morphed over into the life of an evolutionist. It must be tough to be an evolutionist these days because of what you have to believe to stay in the club. And if you don't believe it, you're no longer welcome in that department of that university or something like that. Those guys are under a lot of pressure to keep the party line, so to speak. Uh, all of a sudden, if a geologist becomes a young earth creationist, uh, I imagine it's pretty tough for him in the break room. I imagine uh, his contract may not be renewed or, or things like that. Because in their mind, that's like a mathematician saying two plus two is five now. And you've gotten off the reservation. You're losing your mind, etc., etc. So I thought of ten reasons that it must be tough. And believe me, there's over twice as many. It's kind of like Dave Letterman, you know, 10 reasons of this, and he'll read an index card, and then he'll sling it out in the audience. Kind of like that. So here we go. Reason number 10, we're going to work down to the most, the toughest reason that is tough to be an evolution. Reason 10, you got to believe in the Big Bang and its ability to form the universe. Did you get the word form, the universe, the stars, and ultimately life itself, despite increasing rejection by knowledgeable scholars? They've chosen the worst possible mechanism I can think of. They've chosen an explosion as the foundation of their theory. Explosions don't make things, they tear things up. Amen. They're called bombs. That's why we have bombs, to tear things up. They've chosen the worst possible scenario. you got to believe you can trace your family tree all the way back now, behind you, to the apes, <laughs> through fish, through worms, yes. They believe this through pond scum, through rocks, all the way back to hydrogen gas that came from, boom, a big bang. They've got to believe that. If you don't believe it, you're not welcome in the club. Look what this uh, article says. Rocks and minerals must have played a pivotal role in the transition from the blasted prebiotic earth to the living world we now inhabit. This is what they've got to ascribe to. Dr. Henry Morris, our friend at ICR, Institute for Creation Research, he said the prophet Jeremiah preached that those people of Israel who had abandoned God to worship some pagan idol ought to be deeply ashamed, basically quoting Jeremiah, saying to a tree, you are my father, and to a stone you gave birth to me. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Educated, scholarly people are buying into this that theoretically you could trace your ancestral tree back to a particular rock piece of gravel or something like that and I think it is so gratifying and so telling that I, uh, the prophet Jeremiah hundreds of years before Christ right uh, he he writes this it's as if God told him this is coming in the future we need to record it here the Bible is more current than tomorrow's newspaper remember that now, Bucking the Big Bang, New Scientist magazine, uh, 12 years ago said, the Big Bang relies on things we have never observed. Doesn't sound very scientific. Then. Inflation, dark matter, dark energy, but the Big Bang can't survive without these fudge factors. The Big Bang theory can boast no quantitative predictions that have subsequently been validated by observation. See, all good scientists take data and then they make predictions. <laughs> so, well, okay, I, if this is true, then I predict this is what we're going to find. and uh, But this says that hadn't been working so good for them. Young scientists learn to remain silent if they have something negative to say about the standard Big Bang model. I heard one fellow say 
is so deeply entrenched, we're just going to have to wait until that generation dies off and the Big Bang will go with them and the younger, newer scientists are not so entrenched in it. Now remember that I've got uh, 17 single space typewritten pages right here hooked together of PhD scientists trained in secular universities that have gone on record, risked their careers, signed a letter stating we are skeptical of the claims of evolution. And you can find that at uh, discovery.org website, and I think it's up to about 900 now. Okay, now Dr. Charles Jackson, dear friend of mine and friend of this museum, he says the whole theory of stellar evolution is quite deeply in the realm of the deeply hypothetical and based upon assumption, upon assumption, upon assumption. These guys are awesome in their ever-continuing faith. I thought that was a word we use of church people. And listen, they've got faith. No wonder the Lord said, you've only got to have the faith of a mustard seed because it's not going to be a huge hurdle for you to follow me and to believe what I'm saying is so obviously true. They've got to have tons of faith to believe in, in Big Bang and worms and pond scum and all that in the face of all the data and calculations. Will Rogers said, scientists get bigger and bigger reputation the more they talk about things you just can't check on. <laughs> that's pretty much the story of it. And who's going to go checking on all this astronomical stuff? And Dr. Gish, the late Dr. Gish, isn't it unbelievable what the unbeliever has to believe in order to remain an unbeliever? It's just unbelievable. <laughs> I love these guys. Reason number nine. You've got to believe stars form from the gravitational attraction of space gas particles. That's what they believe from that big bang. Boom, everything's out there in a big spray. And then the particles have a gravitational attraction to each other. They begin to cluster and clump and gradually the clumps come together and you form a star. That's what they believe is a problem. The known laws of physics and chemistry say that the more gravity tries to squeeze gas particles together, the more heat will be generated, like a diesel engine. You may or may not know diesel engines don't have spark plugs. They don't need them. The heat is generated by the molecule friction. You press them in that uh, cylinder with that piston and they're just crashing into each other so much heat. A fairly non-flammable fluid like diesel fuel, sometimes you can hardly get diesel to light with a match. Not so with gasoline, but there's enough heat, boom, it will ignite. Well, anyway, this extra heat causes expansion of the particles outward, not inward, and the outward force is 400 times greater than any gravitational pull. So they have a very unfeasible, unrealistic mechanism for star formation. And everybody knows it that is taken physics uh, 101. All right, what about star formation? This is awesome. Astronomers estimate there's about 100 billion galaxies. They don't really know for sure, and I don't know for sure. It wouldn't surprise me a bit. We've got a big God. And in each of those 100 billion galaxies, they estimate there's 200 billion stars per galaxy. Wouldn't surprise me a bit. And they claim the universe is 20 billion years old. Did you know that's only 6.3 times 10 to the 17th power of seconds? Wouldn't you think there's an awful lot of seconds in a year? And in a thousand years? And in a million years? How about 20 billion years? Do the math. It's only 10 to the 17th power of seconds. It is a long time. Okay, let's grant them that. We don't believe it, but let's grant that to them. And here's the deal. Let's do the math. 100 billion galaxies times 200 billion stars for each one. That's 2 times 10 to the 22nd power. This will be short. Dividing by 6.3 times 10 to the 17th seconds gives you this number, 3.17 times 10 to the 4th. In other words, what that means is 31,746 stars per second would have had to form for us to get that many in only 20 billion years. You know what? We have never seen even one star form. Shouldn't we have seen one if there's over 31,000 per second forming and for 20 billion years? Shouldn't somebody somewhere have seen one form? I think so. The burden of proof is not on us, it's on them. The Bible says, oh, he made the stars also. It's like a parenthetical thought. Oh, by the way, he made the stars also. It's nothing to God. He knows them by name. The stars are made of different things. They are different colors. They emit sounds now and all that. Another subject. 
Reason number eight is tough being an evolutionist these days is because language is not behaving like they thought it should. You see, they thought cavemen just ooh, 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 woman have me, <laughs> you know, or something like that. I don't know. Real simple one syllable words. It didn't work that way. Instead of evolving, language devolved. If man evolved from less intelligent creatures, we would expect the earliest language to be the least complex. The exact opposite is true. When you look at Chinese writing, I mean, it kind of creeps me out. I don't know how they could ever read that or communicate. <laughs> in, you know, the finer nuance type points of a conversation and the ebb and flow of it. And No, 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 I didn't mean it exactly like that. I meant it like this. And, you know, maybe one more dot is going to do that for you or something. I don't know. Anyway, early languages are much more complex than verb usage and syntax. For example, ancient Greek and ancient uh, Chinese are much more complex than their modern counterparts. Ancient Sanskrit goes back to 1500 BC. Each verb had up to 500 variations. This is Sanskrit, this is hieroglyphics, and the top one, of course, is Chinese. I mean, that's pretty intelligent looking to me, that people can make just ever so slight variations in things and come up with a letter. But you know, in reality, isn't the English alphabet the same way? You've got an A that's like this, and a V that's upside down without the crossbar, you know, a few things like that. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing, but the point being, languages aren't behaving in an evolutionary fashion. Now, I taught this girl, among others, of course, in uh, about 140 students this year, all together, in this pre-calculus class. This girl's an exchange student from China. And uh, so I asked her, is it true that this symbol, Chinese symbol, means boat plus eight people? Uh, it equals a large ship, I mean. Boat plus eight people is your symbol for a large ship? She said, yes, that's right. Boat plus eight people is a large boat. Come on, creationists, you know what we're talking about here. <laughs> the Ark of Noah, how many people are on it? Eight, and I was able to share with you your culture. It's got that as the symbol. Let me tell you about Noah and the Ark of Safety and all that. Anyway, region, uh, reason seven, design, it's everywhere. And they believe that there's not a designer, but it's just random accidents. And, oh, uh, I mean, we could go on for days talking about design, just the right amount of gravity on Earth, the sun that's a uh, main sequence, dwarf star, just right. Um, the magnetic field, the Van Allen radiation belts, the ozone layer just shielding us and doing all kind of good stuff for us, the water being the basis of all life. What are they looking for out there for, for a planet that will support life? If it has water in liquid form on it. Underground aquifers, capillary action of plants, I mean uh, sequoias sucking up water all the way up hundreds of feet to the little tips of little uh, green parts. Uh, medicinal plants like digitalis, yew, aloe, penicillin mold. Uh, just amazing design on earth orange tree and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind who seeds in itself photosynthesis takes dirt water and sunlight and makes food it's amazing we know about the bombardier beetle two chambers in its body one with hydrogen peroxide and i don't mean the walmart version of three percent it's like 28 percent it's a very strong oxidizer and the hydroquinone in the other one and he comes into the world with all the right know-how with the inhibitors and the catalyst to uh, give this explosive explosion and protect himself and so on. How in the world could you say that that's a product of random accidents? I mean, dead beetles uh, just don't pass on their genes and that's what would have happened. They would have blown up. And an honest scientist or lay person would likely say this is more likely the result of good design by a masterful designer. And we could go on and on and on. Dolphin sonar, electric eels, water squirting, archer fish, angler fish should go light, fishing with a lighted lure bacteria that consumes toxic waste, whales that can dive seven-tenths of a mile down, camels which can go three months without water, turtle shells, uh, the hollow hair of polar bears. Did you know polar bears had hollow hair? That's amazing to me. Uh, Jackson was telling me that a, a python can go for a year without eating. I had no idea. Uh, beaver dams, I mean, how, uh, birds, how do they make a nest? No thumbs, no fingers. <laughs> You know, I look at the nest, it's a bunch of little straws. How do you get the first one to stay put? I can see after you got kind of a little deal going here, you might, okay, I'm going to put it in here with my beak, you know, I put it in there and I'm bending around and let go. 
Baby, how you get that first one in there? Show me how you does the first one. Human fingerprints, eyes, light sensitive rods and cones, automatic aiming, automatic focus, automatic maintenance, automatic repair. I mean, on and on it goes. Amazing. Design always points to a designer. Amen. Here's that dolphin sonar, the electric eel, 550 volts of electricity. Uh, whale, seven tenths of a mile, an ant. I mean, they're so organized, they communicate. Fire ants, you know, they crawl all on you and they don't all sting you until a pheromone gets released that says, nail him, nail that sucker. <laughs> and then they all sting at once, you know? Spider webs. I don't know how spiders with little pointy legs can run across a spider web. Boy, you're talking about tightrope walking. I, if I was designing them, they'd have a Y-shaped foot, you know, so have a chance of landing on those things and not falling through. But that's me. <coughs> Fireflies. you got to be kidding me. A cicada, 17 years. And you said sometimes they live underground for how long? They can live underground for, I mean, even longer than that. They can, I mean, like 20, 30 years, some species. 20 well, or 30 years in older ground. Older than me when they come out of the ground. In the yes. larval stage? In, in the nymph stage. The nymphs. Uh, the hook and barbules of, uh, barbules of feather design, uh, kind of like Velcro. Falcon wings have one shape, eagle wings another shape. One for diving, one for soaring. Hummingbird wings. The archer fish. I mean, can you believe there's a fish that is born in the water, lives in the water, probably die in the water? Well, unless he gets hooked and yanked out. But uh, he, he understands light's refraction. That where that bug is on that branch is really not where it looks like it is. But he knows it's not where I think it is. So he squirts somewhere else. Who taught him that? And they're amazed at how he understands uh, that, light's refraction the physics of motion, the trigonometry, and all that necessary to make that shot. A water strider taking advantage of the surface tension of water. Uh, birds flying in formation. The uh, strongest bird at the center of the V, uh, making it easier for the younger and weaker birds at the back. Bird migration, they'll go to the very tree that they were conceived in and all that. Polar bears, hollow hair, here's a close-up view. Look like a roll of toilet paper, but it's not. It's a uh, it's a roll of, I mean, it's a, a, a polar bear hair. <laughs> I kid you not, it's polar bear hair. Water storage hump and a camel. An angler, a fish that goes fishing. Are you kidding me? Yes, it has a little lighted lure, and a fish will come, you know, be drawn to it. Oh, boy, not a good idea. Honeycombs, uh, robin's nest. I mean, look at that nest. I just want to see them do it from start to finish. Reason six. The fossil record is the enemy of evolution. You see, Darwin said, I know I don't have any evidence, but the next hundred years I'll, I'll get it. And uh, boy, he thought all of those transitional forms would happen. And uh, here's the deal. We have fossils that have terminal kinds. In other words, a fully developed lizard and a fully developed bird. They wanted something in between and all the other things too. But it's not there. And it's not just a link, it's a chain that's missing, as you know. Evolution, uh, I think it's great what Gould said at Harvard. He says, the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record is the trade secret of paleontology. Oh, 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 the rarity of transitional forms. Dr. David Kitts at OU says, evolution requires transitional forms and paleontology does not provide them. In other words, it's not there, we don't have it, I couldn't show it to you. And what I'm talking about is lizards and birds, for example. They, if it happened that way, that lizards evolved into birds, the fossil record should be mostly those in-between kinds, not just the end products. And yet, the real world, real veal is, it's the end products. It's not anything in between. There should be an 80-20 animal, a 70-30, a 60-40, a 50-50, and so on, and they're not there. And how would they live? I mean, from a, a three-chambered, cold-blooded reptile that changes into a four-chambered heart, warm-blooded bird, I mean, how, how's those intermediates going to be able to live? And Darwin, this is what I said, he, he said the next hundred years is going to give all the evidence. Well, here's Gould, and he says, we sought to impose a pattern that we hope to find on a world that doesn't really display it. So I rest my case, it's not there, the evidence is not good. 
Okay, reason five, you gotta believe that non-living chemicals sprang to life. And they, if they don't believe that, then they're gonna get kicked out of that evolution club. But it's pretty complicated, life is very complicated, and non-living chemicals have never been demonstrated to form life. But they, and they actually admit that, they say, but once it must have happened. Okay, in other words, a miracle. Instead of revealing a multitude of transitional forms through which the evolution of the cell might have occurred, molecular biology has served only to emphasize the enormity of the gap. In reality, folks, chemistry is not our ancestor, it's our problem. You know, I could go kill a mosquito, we got all the chemistry, all the DNA and everything right there. Probably be easier to bring that to life, wouldn't it? I mean, got all the parts, maybe a few of them tore up a little bit, but we'll fix them. And, uh, you know, zap it with radiation or a little spark or, I don't know, uh, those paddles, you know, <laughs> DR or something. <laughs> you know, and maybe, would it spring to life? What about a dead chicken? You see, you just couldn't do that. Life is more than the sum of its parts. There's something lost at death that is unexplainable. And at death, chemistry breaks down that organism into simpler compounds It doesn't reassemble them. And it's time for scientists, I think, to leave 19th century thinking and move into 21st century reality. Come clean with the public that they do have serious reservations. I, I just have to believe that there's evolutionary professors that are having coffee with their wife in the morning and says, honey, uh, you will not believe what I've got to teach these kids. I mean, you just cannot believe what I've got to swallow in order to stay in this job. All right, reason number four, almost getting to one. Soft tissue and dinosaur bones and other animals keeps showing up. They would love for that nightmare to leave. And for soft tissue to stay soft and pliable for millions of years is impossible and the evolutionists know it. Decay should have set in centuries ago. There's no way it could have lasted minimum 65 million years. They constantly have to change their story rather than question evolution itself. And here is some of those uh, uh, evidences of soft tissue. And uh, it's flexible, it returns to its original shape. Uh, and Mary Schweitzer, a very fine lady scientist in Montana State, she says, I'm quite aware that according to conventional wisdom and models of fossilization, these structures aren't supposed to be there, but there they are. I was pretty shocked. Yes, if you're not going to accept what God's Word says and what the real evidence says, you're going to be shocked all the time. And uh, the tissues were soft and transparent. They could be manipulated. Pretty exciting stuff. Uh, he's faking it. They really, it's pretty depressing stuff if you're an evolutionist. May lead scientists to re-examine their theories of fossilization. Uh, wait a minute, how about examining your theory of evolution? Yeah. Yeah. Deputy editor of Science Magazine says soft tissues are rare in older finds. That's why the 70 million year old fossil, it's so interesting. They're spinning this big time. And uh, Dr. Jackson says, uh, instead of uh, questioning their evolutionary thinking, they're trying to figure out a way for fossilization to preserve soft tissue 70 million years. And uh, this is Dr. Schweitzer right here. She says translucent blood vessels by all the rules of paleontology should have long since drained from the bones. It's a matter of faith. Did you get that word? Mm -hmm. Among scientists that soft tissue can survive at most for a few tens of thousands of years, not 65 million since T-Rex walked Hell Creek. And she got a letter from a guy, she said, I had one reviewer tell me, he didn't care what the data said, he knew that what I was finding wasn't possible. Dr. Boss, like those people that came and saw those human footprints, that's not possible, and they turned on a dime and left. Well, I wrote back and I said, well, what data would, would convince you? And he said, none, none. I have my mind made up, don't convince me with, don't try to influence me with facts. Well, once the publicity started rolling in because of soft dinosaur tissue, Look what happened. Many of these scientists had been sitting on stuff and just holding it, holding the, the cards to their vest. Uh, here's one that says, oh, well, I don't want to say anything, but I had 10 million year old frog uh, marrow. Oh, and I have 400,000 year old bear DNA. And oh, I've got 90 million Santana raptor muscle tissue. And all these websites, I got 300,000 year old mammoth connective tissue. Oh, I got Neanderthal DNA. And well, where are you guys? Where y'all been? Why does it matter? Well, biochemical kinetic laws say proteins can't last even 40,000 years. 
evolutionists ignore laws and just say Schweitzer's work is just showing us we really don't understand decay. Yes, we do. Decay is rotting. It's stuff, that's what dead stuff does. And there's just really lots of basic stuff that people just make assumptions about. So which should we trust? The known laws of science or the assumptions that evolutionists just make so they can keep believing Darwin? Oh, and you'll be thrilled with this one. Reason number three, evolutionists believe that humans evolved from chimps, then four million years later started mating together with chimps. And I'm not making this up. Don't blame me. Humans and chimpanzees first split up about 10 million years ago in this article. Then after evolving different directions about 4 million years, they got back together for a brief fling, produced a third hybrid population with characteristics of both lines. <laughs> really? And uh, Nature Online magazine, something very unusual happened at the time of the chimp to human speciation. What's unusual? They says basically the same thing. They evolved from chips four, 4 million years later chimps and humans mating together again. And uh, Harvard Evo anthropologist Daniel Lieberman admits, it's a totally cool analysis, but my problem is imagining what it would be like to have a hominid and a chimp viewing each other as appropriate mates, not to put it too crudely. Oh, we appreciate that. <laughs> hey, baby. <laughs> I mean, just laugh at it. It's so comical. Reason number two. Mutations. Oh, here we go again with mutations. For years they've said mutations was their, their key mechanism. That these mutations, birth defects, were going to give us all this new information that we needed. And we know most of it's that lethal or neutral. And, uh, but their belief is every once in a while there'll be a beneficial mutation. And they're quick to cite an example of beetles with stunted wings on the Galapagos Islands. And how would stunted wings be good for any flight creature? Well, they say it's real windy, and so they're not fl blown out to sea. Okay, well, most places other than the Galapagos Islands, and they might, the beetles would probably opt if they had a choice. Well, I'd rather have real, real beetle wings, you know, not the little deformed ones. So it's a highly uh, subjective evaluation of whether it's beneficial or not. Anyway, the term. Uh, number one, there's what I said, it's highly subjective. Most mutations, neutral or lethal, and a mutation is a birth defect, and it always results in a loss of information. That's the take-home lesson. Mutations always are a loss of information. How are you going to get a net gain in information, go from pond scum to Einstein, when you're losing information all the time? And evolution is really all about information gain. And it's illogical to go downhill for a million steps and then up for one, and then conclude that life somehow has an upward urge. In addition, we all have a genetic load. You might want to pay attention to this. And these are copying errors, and here's why. You and I get our DNA not from Adam and Eve, but from our parents. We are a copy of our parents, and they are a copy of theirs. And we are all a copy of 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 a copy back to Noah and his sons and ultimately Adam and Eve. So they're copying errors, mistakes. And this is increasing exponentially with each generation. Scientists know that just one additional mutation per generation would lead to extinction eventually. Okay? Now, current count of human gene disorders like Alzheimer's, sickle cell anemia, muscular dystrophy, and so on. By the way, I was thinking the other day, just from my casual observation, that when people get sick nowadays, it's not so much that they're sick because of pathogens like measles or the flu or something like that that you catch from somebody. More likely we're, we're sick because of autoimmune things or, or some kind of defect. Uh, we've got sickle cell anemia, a defective gene, or like John Morris uh, who was here for the Archathon, uh, was it muscular dystrophy? Sclerosis. Or sclerosis and a stroke. You know, well, you could visit him, but you're not going to catch uh, a stroke. You're not going to catch, uh, what you say? Multiple sclerosis. Uh, and that sort of thing. Well, I believe that's related to these uh, gene disorders. Now, look right here. 1960, there were a thousand identified in the human genome. And of course, it was rudimentary there, but look at that progression 1990, maybe 5,000. And this is Dr. Joseph uh, Mastropalo, which I think was. Uh, 
Paolo, he spoke on uh, creation in the 21st century, yes, didn't he? A number of times. A number of times. And uh, year 2000, 10,000 copying errors, 2010, 30,000, and so on and so forth. His prediction is 2085, humans are extinct. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's right or not. And it may be overstatement. But the pattern is there. Now, a, a believer really is not all that upset about that. Because we're going to our final home anyway. You know, but to someone who hopes to find the fountain of youth or something, uh, yeah, that's going to be pretty devastating. And mutations destroy life, not create it. All right, now studying DNA, I want you all to see the picture of a man's face who was an atheist for 81 years. And this is Dr. Uh, Professor Anthony Flew from England. And uh, leading atheist now believes in God, Associated Press report in uh, 2004. What I think the DNA material has done is show that intelligence must have been involved in getting these extraordinarily diverse elements together. I want to give you a little encouragement that we are discovering things that are leading people to the Lord. And reason number one is tough being an evolutionist today is because of what's in this new publication by our friends at ICR, Institute for Creation Research. Major news Extra, extra, read all about it. <laughs> DNA trends confirm Noah's family. We now have the software, church, that will enable us to input into it the DNA markers from a diverse global population sample. And that has been done. And that diagram that you see there, and by the way, the bottom right, is that one of the employees, one of the scientists at ICR, Brian Thomas. He was here at the dig, was it last year or the year before? The year before. The year before, uh, he was here. And I just learned, Dr. Ball said, that he has actually been employed here at the museum and has done work. Uh, he's an excellent writer, science writer, and so on. And look at this diagram. The mitochondrial DNA, and let me remind you that mitochondrial DNA only comes through the female line. Whether you're a man or a woman, you got your mitochondrial DNA from your mother. And now 99.5% of all your DNA is in the nucleus, but a half of a percent is in the little piece of the cell called the mitochondria. So it makes the uh, search narrows down. It's narrowed down for you a lot. And so they can, they can track that pretty well. Now, do you see the three blue arrows? I, I sent, sent it, uh, with them with red arrows. Those three nodes of that software shows a convergence to that node of the three wives of Noah's sons. How amazing a confirmation is that? Now I was on the phone with Brian Thomas an hour ago and I'd been trying to reach him all day. We finally connected uh, an hour ago. And I had a few questions and uh, and the most technical nature, and I don't think I'll get into it too much. I did ask him, what about this fourth node right here? I said, was that Mr. and Ms. Noah? Because they still probably could have had some more children after the flood. And he said, no. Notice that that one is connected to that third node. This is just a, uh, a variation that showed that there were some similarities there but the distance away from the node is significant. So these are way away. And the farther out it is from the node, the more time it represents. I believe is what he said. And what he says is, this is Japheth's wife's node. Uh, node. This is Ham's, and this is uh, Shem's. So the Shemites, the Hamites, and uh, I guess the, uh, what do you call them? Japhethites. The, the what? The Jacobites? Okay. All right. Now let me show you what the article says. MTDNA stands for mitochondrial DNA. Human, mito, uh, human mitochondrial DNA tree showing the three central nodes. This is from the magazine article. These fit the number of expected mitochondrial DNA sequence differences between the three wives of Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Jensen, that's Nathaniel G. Jensen, a very fine scientist also at ICR who did most of the technical work. His data shows that the human mitochondrial DNA tree has those three nodes. 
Thus, everyone alive today carries one of three unique ancestral maternal sequences. As Dr. Ball said, listen to every word. You know, the longest, contiguous, human excavated dinosaur trail in the Northern Hemisphere. Every word is important. Carries one of three unique ancestral maternal, coming from the mother's line, sequences. This fits Genesis' claim that all humans who exist today descended from one of the wives of Noah's sons. <laughs> and read on. In short, the article says, if all peoples descended from three genetically unique mothers, then number one, our mitochondrial DNA sequences should trace back to their three nodes. Number two, these nodes should have about eight differences between them. And then number three, plus a strict biblical timeline suggests 123 as the highest number of mitochondrial DNA differences that should be observed today. Check, check, and check. That's in the article. These three mitochondrial DNA trends trace all of humanity back to Noah's son's three wives, a striking intersection of biblical history and modern genetics. Wow. Wow. This is like LeBron James and a slam dunk. <laughs> this is dynamite. This is in the July of 2016 issue of Acts and Facts from ICR, Institute for Creation Research. Don't we have a great God? Amen. And one of the things I'm so grateful to him about is that he does not require a blind faith. I would be so troubled if I was compelled to be in a faith, a religion, if you will, where I had to just accept things so blindly because I said so kind of thing. We have a Savior that didn't cast Thomas out of his presence and send him to hell because he doubted. He had mercy because that was a man that just needed a little bit of evidence. He was this close to being a great follower of Christ. Is this close. All he needed was a little bit of evidence. You are sitting in the Creation Evidence Museum. We've got it, church. Amen. We've got the evidence. We've got plenty. We've got plenty. On the other hand, evolution is the emperor that has no clothes. Right. <laughs> what a great day to be alive. Amen. What a wonderful time to be a Bible-believing Christian. We've got more at our fingertips now than any generation has ever had to make a compelling case for God being the creator. And because you now can show that Genesis is true, then you should have great, greater success at getting a person to see that he is also the Savior because they are one and the same. What an amazing thing. So you've seen 10 reasons it's tough being an evolutionist. The Big Bang star formation, language, the incredible design in nature, fossils, the absence of transitional forms, spontaneous generation, soft dinosaur tissue, their worst nightmare, chimp to human to, to chimp, mutations, and human convergence of mitochondrial DNA. Aren't you glad there's a much better explanation? Yes.